it's noon, so it's time for What's New at One Schoolhouse. I'm Sarah Hanewald, Assistant Head of School here at One Schoolhouse for Professional Development and New Programs. And I have with me today, we're, we're all in-house. I have Peter Gao, who has um, doesn't need a lot of introduction to very many of you. And um, Peter, your current title is Independent Curriculum Resource Director director with one school house and then our head of school is joining us today so brad thank you so much for coming and joining us today to do this hi everybody all right so on our blog authored by brad content covered is not equal to content learn and if you have not read that once i'm uh, not talking more i'm going to drop that into the chat because that is a great conversation piece maybe one to save and use during the debrief time that you have with your admin team after school's over. Next week webinar, next week's webinar is, it's not over, but there is a map and the generic use of it is intentional. We're gonna talk about all the things that are not quite finished yet, but we have more insight than we have in the past as to how we might get there. Um, Online learning, we are hearing from schools that you've got some kids who can't come back on campus next year. And we have some solutions to help schools with that. And we would love to talk to you about that. We've got some courses that we don't generally offer that we're gonna offer next year. And Brad, do you have anything that you wanna highlight for those courses? No, I think Sarah, generally it's just that uh, that we're hearing from schools that some handfuls of kids may not be able to come back this fall. And so we've expanded our course catalog to include uh, uh, core academic courses so that um, uh, if your faculty is not in a position to be able to teach concurrently this fall, which we're continuing to hear has been a huge stressor for schools, um, this gives you some options to handle some of those core academic courses. Absolutely, thank you. Um, advanced independent curriculum. That's what we're here to talk about today. So if you have not uh, gotten your copy yet, that's another link I'm gonna drop in the chat. We'll use the Q&A for our questions and answers as we go through. And in the chat, I'll be dropping some resources and some links. Uh, upcoming professional development, we've got our advanced independent curriculum courses that will follow up on the topics that we introduce in this webinar. We also have a course that Brad and I are doing together on technology considerations for academic leaders. And this is really um, not, you know, how do you operate the owls in the classroom, but how do you leverage these new technologies that you've adopted this past year to go forward? How do you help them become part of your academic strategy? And particularly in relation to the learning management system. How do you use your learning, learning management system effectively um, moving forward? Absolutely. Um, other summer professional learning that we have coming up, reflect, restore, and renew. We've got courses for academic leaders and teachers on how do we build forward into the next normal from this school year. And then a course that we offer periodically that is very well received and has been described as transformational building trust how to have important conversations professionally on campus to help build professional communities of trust. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and bring us all back full screen. So, all right, thank you everyone for joining us. And Peter, there's something you have been saying to me for a long time, which is what are you going towards in regards to independent curriculum? So it's not a move away from, it's a move towards. Can you give me some background about how you developed that question and that statement? Sure, Sarah, thanks. Well, teachers are optimists by nature, or they, we wouldn't be doing what we do. I guess I'm still a teacher. And so whenever teacher talk turns to curriculum, the conversations at the grassroots level are about doing something that's better, better for kids. And we also know that when we make our language positive, it's about our own growth mindset. So the ideas behind independent curriculum were born more than 20 years ago when a bunch of teachers and academic leaders looked at the state of advanced courses that were designed to challenge and engage our most ambitious students and we said, hey, we can do better. We can dig into and harness the missions and values and highest objectives of our schools 
the interests and needs of our own students, about the talents and passions of our own faculty, and we can create our own courses that will really fire up our students. We can really build courses that will inspire kids to see the world in newer and more nuanced ways, minus the kind of pointless stress that comes with a hyper-focus on stringing together right answers on one high-stakes exam. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> we said, hey, let's focus on where we can go and on the ways we can start to incorporate everything we now know about how kids learn and how this can inspire us and liberate us to create courses that not only engage students but help them more deeply and fully understand how the world works and how they can play a meaningful part in it. Our students' families hired us to, not just to get them into whatever the next big thing is, college or secondary school, but to make good on all the promises we make in our mission statements and our statements of values. We can do all of this. And when we started sharing these ideas with colleges, often very specifically between our college counselors and college admission offices, the colleges said, great, sounds like a way to give your students something special. Just be sure to tell us all about it in your profile. And that's what we've been working towards, something that's better, better for kids. Yeah, and I love that you brought up this. How do you share this in the college profile? When Brad and I were talking about this webinar, I shared that one of my favorite books is What the Best College Students Do. And I think he made a face, which people usually do when I bring that book up, because it sounds like it's all about how to get A's in college. And it's not. Um, it's written by Ken Bain. And what he writes about, first of all, everybody should read it. And it's a great graduation gift. Um, but there, I'm not his agent and I don't get a cut. So I just said it. <laughs> but it's about being a purposeful college student. It's about making connections between your course and your internship and in the real world and from course to course. And so when Brad and I were talking about that, Brad, you made the observation that college preparedness is different from now, now from what it used to be. And I'm really interested in you talking a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think we're all coming to that realization, don't you, Sarah? I mean, the, the college preparedness is more about the competencies and the habits of mind and that purpose-driven life um, that we hope that our students are starting to explore differently at the next level, at that collegiate level, um, than it is about preparing them, uh, preparing our students for the academic content that they will come into contact with uh, at the collegiate level. Um, and yet, uh, for generations, independent schools hired folks who really were at that kind of collegiate level professorship. Uh, you know, we hired a lot of folks in, with PhDs and folks who were deep, deep, deep content experts um, in order to train our students for that next level classroom. But if the purpose of college is a little bit different and the competencies required are gonna be a little bit different and the type of work that we do with our students in our own classrooms at secondary schools should also be a little bit different. Um, we're requiring kind of deeper thinking. Um, it's, it's reasons why things like gap years often matter. And there's new research, you know, right on, on gap years and the importance of gap years between the high school and collegiate experience. Um, so, you know, as we were thinking about that at one schoolhouse and in our, our merger with the independent curriculum group, we really saw an opportunity to take the exceptional work that ICG had done over the years in developing principles for independent curriculum and dive deeper uh, to expand them a bit uh, uh, to include some standards that are needed to help academic leaders and teachers alike uh, build their vision for their programs. Um, Peter, you might want to jump in here and talk about how uh, standards, well, it's, it's standards without standardization, right? And I know, Peter, you use that phrase often, and, and it's so important to think, um, to think in that way, that standards are not a limiting factor, but actually can be a liberating factor. Absolutely. And before Peter jumps in, I'm just going to add our friends at ERB, one of the things that they've pointed out to us is that one of the struggles of this past year is transfer, reasoning skills. It's those kinds of things that we think about and I don't want to say worry about the most, but kind of do worry about the most. 
So Peter, sorry Actually, to jump in on you. I mean, I, I know I've said this before on these webinars, but go back to that webinar that Tom did in February. It was not content acquisition. ERB showed us it was not content acquisition that was the that was the challenge. It was the transfer of knowledge. All right, Peter. Now we'll not, we'll really pull you in. Sorry about that. Nothing to be sorry about. Well, first, I want to credit uh, Grant Wiggins, the late Grant Wiggins, uh, who inspired so many of us and, and really inspired me personally uh, in this work for the standards uh, and without standardization uh, uh, phrase, because it really just captures so much. <clears throat> but that gets to a question, and the question is, the hardest question about curriculum, about, you know, how do you know what you're doing is any good. And, you know, we have some old fashioned ideas that are floating around about what rigor means, painful and onerous work and lots of it, uh, but almost no actual language about what advanced means other than rigorous, which keeps showing up that word, or college level. Um, and which college would that be? And what year for a student to be in that college or what, uh, what level course are they taking? So when teachers have challenged themselves to create advanced curriculum on their own, um, they've had to trust their own knowledge and their own best instincts. And generally, this has worked out really well. But we also know that people have been wishing for some kind of guidelines that would add some consistency to the process. So what we've done is to take all that we know about effective curriculum and assessment design and all we know from research and experience, and one schoolhouse has a ton of it, about what high-level coursework both looks like and can be. We put these together into a set of standards that are just that, guidelines for advanced coursework design and delivery so the teachers who use these are at least working from some consistent language ideas and, I'll say it, ideals. When a teacher is building a course using these standards, I like to imagine that the standards are like a little voice that is constantly asking the question, how do you know that it's any good? And affirming the teacher's creativity and skill as they go into that design process. A course that meets the standards is going to be very good by definition and probably great. Teachers can rest assured that they're working to high standards that are designed specifically to be enticing guidelines and not constraints. When you are freed and encouraged and coached to be your best, you're liberated, Sarah. And that's what these standards are intended to do. Sarah, before can I ask Peter a question? Before I, I'm sure you have another question or thought that you want to add in there. Peter, one of the things that you kind of mentioned there that was an aha as you were speaking this time about this to me is uh, teachers developing those high quality courses were also coming from their own lived perspective and lived interpretations of what rigorous and college level meant, right? Yes. Which can also be a limiting factor for schools from an equity and diversity perspective. Oh, absolutely, Brad. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, we particularly I think at sort of the advanced level of curriculum when we advanced whatever that means um, we have tended to be working from a very narrow framework uh, that you know dates back to the you know committee on uh, the committee of 10 uh, on curriculum uh, 120 some years ago and we need and we know that we need uh, but we don't always, we haven't always previously necessarily had the tools for bringing in multiple perspectives to the, the content, to the work that students are actually doing, to the learning experiences they're having, uh, and, to the, uh, and to the outcomes. And just to acknowledge that there is a world out there beyond the classroom walls is is a huge thing and our, our standards really really do that that's one of the to me one of the coolest things about them so defining rigor defining college readiness defining some of those terms actually really will help make sure that we're not talking about the individual lived perspective of one teacher but instead trying to live out those missions and values differently yes more fully yeah 
sorry, Sarah, I wanted to make, I, I, it just occurred to me there that we should, we should talk about that for a sec. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And we've had a lot of conversations about this where I've said, oh my gosh, this is what we, we need to tell people that idea of you've got a vision of something you're moving towards. And there's that, there's the gut instinct, but there's also that professional judgment that experienced academic leaders have about what is the right thing for kids, for families, for teachers, and even for colleges, right? Do we actually serve colleges well, even not that that's our job, but do we serve them well when we send students who are prepared to do these things? Um, so we wanted a shorthand for the hard work that teachers and academic leaders were doing to build these new courses. So hence, Advanced Independent Curriculum Certification. And Brad, can you share where the genesis for course certification happened? Yeah, we, we you know, Sarah, you kind of captured a, a lot of it there. You know, as, as all of you on this webinar know, you know, one schoolhouse, we try to be a partner in innovation for the work that schools are doing. Um, and we saw an opportunity here to help schools accelerate their work in this area by not just giving out the standards that may be helpful for a school that wants to go down this route and expanding upon the great principles that ICG had created, um, but also then giving them a shorthand to know that, uh, giving them a shorthand to be able to say quickly, um, this, is, uh, this is what we're doing and why. Um, and that it meets some set of outside parameters. One of the things that I think a lot of schools like, even if they gripe about, uh, is that there is some outside validation of other of standardized on uh, uh, top level courses. Um, and so um, the advanced Advanced curriculum uh, uh, certification is really just meant to be a shorthand for that to help schools out to be able to say, hey, this meets some type of outside validation, which we think can both help with internal audiences and external audiences. Um, parents are often asking us the question, right? How do we know that this is any good? To be honest, AP is kind of a shorthand way to, for schools to tell their parents, this is an advanced level course, which has outside certification for that. Um, as a number of independent schools are working towards advanced independent curriculum certification, it will allow schools to say, hey, this is not just something that we think is good, but there's outside validation of that. And there's this group of independent schools that are all working towards this and they are all wonderful peer institutions. Yeah, one of the things that you said to me is that we serve as a partner in innovation. And yep. so there's a way of, of serving as that. And then something else that you said that I think is it reminds me of a conversation I had with the director of college counseling at one of the schools that moved to an advanced independent curriculum. And she said when they invited families in and had parents and caregivers come where they described the courses, they got the feedback of, oh my gosh, I wish I could take this class. Right. And that that was a really valuable piece. Yeah. And, and Sarah, I think, you know, as we designed out the certification process too, something you might want to talk about for a second, because you've been deep in that process is we know that teachers really hate some of the other processes because they feel like they're just checking boxes right and and then they feel like you know how is it that this ap certification came back to me in 20 minutes as all okay right like nobody's giving me the feedback that i need this doesn't seem valuable this seems like i'm just checking boxes and as you've been designing the certification process for aic you've been really kind of careful about making sure that any feedback that's going to go to faculty is really valuable and meaningful and that they feel like the process itself is is driving them um, to making their course experiences better. Yes. And so I've been working on this since you and I first began talking about this this project a little over a year ago and thinking about how do we set up a system that honors and recognizes the hard work that teachers and academic leaders do in building courses like this, but that doesn't ask the hard work to be on the certification side, but that the certification reflects the hard work that actually benefits students and families. Yeah. Right. So we wanted anything that was onerous, sophisticated to be in the course building and not in the explaining to us what we do. So actually, can I share the screen for, again for a second? Let me do that. I'm just going to show you all the page and I'll drop the link to this in the chat as well. So when you look at 
course certification. It's a process. And so there is the prepare, right? Is this the right thing for us? What do we need to do? There's a ton of work that goes on campus to decide what is an advanced independent course that aligns with our mission? What does that mean? And it might be a place space. It might be a particular aspect of your mission that distinguishes you among peer schools. It might be, it, there's all kinds of reasons for a school to say, this is how we're going to go in this advanced course, whether it's in literature, in the sciences, in a language, your definition of your pinnacle course that the most advanced students are taking just before they leave you aligns with your mission. So then when you make your case to us, your job is to share three things with us. We've got a rubric. If you haven't downloaded it, use that link, get the principles and standards. So you're gonna show here's the evidence that our course meets these principles and standards. And then you're gonna make a video, which is an opportunity, not like a scary video that's gonna show up on YouTube that we're gonna have everywhere. This is a tour of your course. Here's what I'm doing. It's very similar to the presentation that you might give to the families on campus. So you could even view it as practice for that. And then the third thing is an exemplar. It's a piece of student work that captures the essence of what it is that you're creating. And of course we want it stripped of anything identifying, but something that you've created for students to do that demonstrates their mastery of your outcomes. So that's it, those three. Um, and I'll, again, I'll drop that link in and I wanna open this up for question because I know that we'll have some questions, but Peter, when you look at that, is there anything to you that you say, yeah, this is, this is what we were talking about? Yes, because you're, <laughs> the work is being done within the school to imagine what it is that the mission and values of that institution and the, the goals of that, you know, division, that department, what do they want to do for students? It's not about checking boxes that somebody else has has created. Um, these are the the standards are are designed to be inspirational. Ooh, we could do this. We could do that. They're not designed to be a prescription, and that is so 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 very important to me. Uh, that this is really well. You can probably tell I, I'm kind of a, a mission guy. So. <laughs> Great. Well, I've gotten a question and it came to me. I just want to remind everybody, use the Q&A and you can make your question anonymous if you want to. That's a box that you can check. So if you would prefer, um, you're absolutely welcome to do that. But this question is, so isn't certification what we're trying to move away from? And I think that's a totally fair question uh, because I get it. Right, and so that is why we designed the system the way that we did in that it is not prescriptive. So it is a marker of how do you know it's any good? And here's the, you've been through the rigor, you've established something that's mission aligned. So you've demonstrated that it is good and you're giving you know, I, the opportunity to use it in your course catalog. You can say it's an AIC certified course. So that's one answer to that question. So Brad and Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd just frankly say for some schools, certification is probably not necessary. Like that's just an internal call, right? Like for schools for whom outside validation is helpful or it's helpful to have an outside, outside validation for particular teachers in their own development, et cetera. You know, that's, that's why we're offering this as kind of a partnership thing. Um, and for schools for whom the uh, it is totally beneficial to just maybe use these standards as a inspiration for their faculty. That's a great way to do it too. And also, the standards give give those schools that aren't going to be seeking certification. Um, if, if nothing else, it gives them language that they can use to help them describe um, the nature of these courses, whether it's to you know in their own course catalog, whether it's on their uh, school profile that the college counseling office uses, whatever it might be. But yeah, absolutely. You don't have to be certified to have an advanced independent curriculum course. No, the, 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 the bigger point there, Peter, I'm sure you want to touch on this, is that you're using common definitions. 
when you talk about rigor, you all are talking the same language. You're not talking, you know, across each other, right? Like one of the huge challenges in our schools is that different teachers define rigor differently. Many of your teachers may define rigor as just simply additional textbooks for this class or additional books for your English class or additional work for these students, um, additional content covered. That's not how we think of rigor. Um, no. Go ahead, yeah. And we're really inviting people to, uh, to, to have that conversation about, you know, w within their schools. That's the other thing that these standards yeah. can do is they can, you know, you don't have to just use these for your independent classes. You can take the concepts that are in them and apply it everywhere. Right. I give the example often of um, student teacher connections, right? Like we all in independent schools want to make sure that students and teachers feel incredibly connected to each other. Um, however, we don't then go to the next level of saying what that actually means, right? And so often that can be misinterpreted by faculty as the kids like me rather than what uh, academic leaders often think of, which is the trust relationship, a strong trust relationship between the student and the teacher in the classroom, uh, where they're mutually working towards shared goals. You know, that's more what we mean by a strong student teacher relationship rather than the kids like me, but without that additional interpretation, without the definitions behind what we actually mean here, you can get cross signal really fast. So I've got another question that's come in, but before I address that, I also wanna say, that our course is really good. So sorry, that's kind of a shameless plug, but I think as an opportunity to connect with other people who are wanting to do independent curriculum courses, the opportunity to engage with a community, I know that that is something that this year has become more important than ever. What is somebody else who does what I do? Because many advanced independent school teachers are, you know, they're, a, they're solo. They're the only person teaching what they teach on their campus. And so the course and the certification opportunity to connect and to swap ideas and to remain in touch over the years is potentially useful. And as far as I'm concerned, having been at this for a long time, building those, those conversations across schools, within schools, that's what all of this is about. We know we don't get better at our work unless we talk to one another about it, and unless we share those ideas and questions and resources. And you know, just designing this course and, and it has been really fun. So the question I got was, what did I mean by place-based? And um, I think that's something that it's one of those terms that we use a lot, um, but don't necessarily take a moment to define. So I'm going to give you the Sarah definition, and then Peter, I know, has done a lot of work on this, so I'm going to ask him to chime in too. But so if, when I think about play space, it's taking advantage of exactly where you are. So there's your mission, but there's also just your geographic location. And so if you are a boarding school in the mountains, in the most advanced environmental science class might look very different from an urban school that is dealing with um, different kinds of environmental toxins or hazards that they want students to examine during that course. Or you might have a nearby university where you would want students to connect. And so does anatomy and physiology look different on one campus versus another? So those are the kinds of things I think about. Peter, what about you? Uh, Sarah, I think you've, you've about covered it. It's really using the resources that are available, the, the community connections, the the natural environment, the the knowledge of local or regional history, whatever it might be, to inspire coursework that builds that magic word relevance into everything that you do, that, that connects what's going on in the classroom to the greater world outside. Uh, and I know that there are some people uh, who are really beginning to do some amazing, and their people have been doing it for a long time, but there are people who are really trying to now start building connections to create a, a stronger place-based learning community of educators. And we hope that this work will, will help that along as well. And to that end, um, I just put in the chat uh, a number of resources that mainly Peter has created uh, over the years that are up on uh, our uh, innovation library. Uh, on the One Schoolhouse website. So uh, to the extent that it's helpful to see examples of that, uh, you can click on that page and see them. Great. 
Thank you. Um, we're getting to the end. So if you have a question or something that you think of, absolutely reach out. We would love to talk to you about advanced independent curriculum. And I'll just chime in once on what Peter just said, which is the tragedy in schools that have been creating these fantastic place spaces courses is that they weren't available to their most advanced students who had something to prove on their transcript. And so I think advanced independent curriculum lets a school marry those two senses of purpose. Well, thank you, Peter and Brad. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brad.